you know, these islands are very special. It's really the beginning of my story. I mean, Cape Barren was my birthplace, my birth home. Some of the very special shell collecting places are on the island are just absolutely beautiful scenery and you know you could spend days and hours there in a sense when it when it's calm the weather actually influences really when you can collect so we've got to look at our tide book to see when we're going to have a spring tide and there might be one or two a year or sometimes there's a year where there's very poor tides and you may get one spring tide or none at all you almost got to do your collecting from spring through to autumn and then try and do your making in the winter because obviously it does get too cold but that's how we have to collect because it's very difficult you've got to bend right down in the water almost to your ankles and then really search that kelp they disguise their outer coating with the color of the kelp in a sense they quite often live very close to the main stalk of that very floating almost ferny looking kelp but that's the really enjoyable part about collecting the mariners have been in the water once you can get in there and you feel comfortable it's just that beautiful therapeutical sense about being in the water if it's a bad tide you've probably only got an hour and a half to be there to collect if it's a good tide you could collect for three hours and then we would go up to the western side of Flinders to collect some dry shells which you can collect cockles or cat's teeth and uh, get kelp shells at Lady Baron. We collect black crow shells and gull shells which are little bluey grey shells and there's, we can collect rice shells. Obviously a lot of these names are common names that, that my mother's generation or her mother um, named these shells and so we, we always keep to that and, and not so much the scientific name. I mean all of the places around Lady Baron, which is the south end of Flinders Island, we c can collect mariner shells they are the only ones that I collect live because that was traditionally how they were collected. I collect them on the islands and then bring them back to Launceston. So I put them in sandwich bags and freeze them and then bring them back frozen. Then they put outside to what we call rot out. So then they washed because they end up in a slurridge of like, like a mud almost at the bottom of the tamer, if you can imagine what the bottom of the tamer looks like. And so they rinse several times and then clean with a, an acid solution, which has to be very specific because you can ruin your shells. Once that's happened, they then rinsed again with clear water and usually we lay them out on newspapers then to dry and then we'd sit down and sort them in sizes and then pierce them ready for making or stringing. The old women called it stringing their shells. So, um, I mean, the stringing takes a while. It's hard to say, well, I, I would sit down and do a long necklace all in one go if I need to. If it's the rice shells, those little tiny shells that fit under your fingernail, obviously I don't make two of those in a row. I usually try and spend my time using the s smaller shells and then I'll make a necklace with bigger shells or I'll sit down and do some bracelets and that evens it out a little bit more so and it makes it more enjoyable. I first learnt from mum, I think I would have first threaded a necklace with mum. I was lucky to probably have had 10 or 12 years making and learning with mum but I've also learnt a lot from my mother-in-law Dulcie so I've been very lucky to have had two strong women from either side the family because mm. I had really taken it seriously when we lived on Cape Barren as a kid we just went and help collect the shells. And obviously when I first started making, I tried to make a pattern that was Lola Greeno's pattern. And I think the first few I made was made with some green manners, which is so becoming so scarce and very hard to find now. And you have to have a really good spring tide to get the green mariners. And one place unfortunately does seem to be affected by pollution, absolutely because it's in between the wharf and a boat slip. So you can imagine what's coming from both ways. I also didn't make bracelets to start with because I thought, no, this is not really part of the tradition. Forgetting that, you know, we what we do today is all very contemporary, but based on our tradition of what our heritage is. I've moved from just collecting little shells to make shell necklaces to making more cultural 
three-dimensional sculptural pieces in a sense and thinking about body adornment and and how we would use some of this these resources in the future I think. So I've looked at working with other cultural material. So all of the work if you look at those they all relate to you know what we wore as in the shell necklaces or the feathers like this mutton bird that we ate and in a sense it it saves it saves our shell industry um, or, or our cultural practice and my granddaughters love coming to the beach and and then for them to learn some of these common names of what the shells were. I think they're so inspired that, that it's not going to be forgotten with them. It's really important. The exhibition that you see here, as um, it was said earlier, is part of a program of exhibitions and publications that acknowledges um, some of the leading contemporary craftspeople in Australia uh, who have had 30 plus years professional practice and who ha are not only just great artists and makers of work but have also given to the arts industry and this is some other this is the other side of Lola that if you read her stories you'll read about how she's worked on different art boards she worked for Taz Arts she teaches young women she takes them on camp she's been very and she fulfilled that requirement um, the thing about the exhibitions that we do at object is that if I had to call it their style they're design exhibitions they're exhibitions of craft. This is not a museum designed exhibition. It has caused a bit of ruckus with the traditionalists because, the, as Caroline said, the way the necklaces are presented is in a very non-museum type of presentation. Right from the beginning, Lola and I had an idea that we wanted to make this um, an installation style exhibition and that if we could have had some form of body shape that were wearing the necklaces to show people what they looked like rather than the traditional in the tight round circles that you get them in the museums. Um, we wanted to do that but we had lots of restrictions uh, conservation wise to protect the shells that are very fragile uh, and that are touring for over four years around Australia. So we had a very clever designer, Stephen Goddard, who listened very, very closely to what Lola and I were saying, that we wanted it to be installation. We wanted to have that feeling that when people walked in and stood up looking at one of the long necklaces, they could imagine themselves wearing the necklace or they could be feeling as if they were talking to um, somebody who was wearing the necklace. And this is where the idea of the groupings come from. When you walk into the exhibition, the tall cases that house the long necklaces look like groups of people standing together wearing their necklaces. The shorter tripods with the cases on, they also have a connection too. That the t um, Lola talks a lot about the tussocks of grass that are on the sand dunes and in around the water's edge and how they were used when they used to go mutton birding. They used to go and cut the grass tussocks and lay them on the floor. And it was one of the things that struck me each time I went to the beach with Lola were all these grasses everywhere. And so Stephen says that if you look at the shorter ones and sort of reverse them, they're mimicking the grass tussocks that are there. So this exhibition has many, many, many layers in it. It's, it's not just an exhibition of the traditional necklaces. It's the contemporary work. It also tells a story. One thing I wanted as a curator to get across to people again from the beginning was the importance of this tradition that 
mainland Australians know very little of. You go to Tasmania and everybody knows about Lola Greeno, about shell collecting, about um, the stringing and what goes on at Flinders Island and around the country. But outside of there, uh, unless people have had some connection with Lola or, or a shell stringing person or have gone to somewhere like the National Museum of Australia or the National Art Gallery or the Australian Museum and seen the necklaces there, they know really nothing about it. Traditionally, the necklaces were short before the European, the European invasion, as they call it, or the colonists coming down to Tasmania. And they were short and they were only marinier shells, which is the actual shell for the indigenous Tasmanian. And they were the only shells that they ever strung, and they were strung in short necklaces. And in the book, in Lola's monograph, there's a photograph of Chuganini, and she has a number of short necklaces round her neck. Now, the reason that those necklaces were short was because they were more practical to wear, but also because they had, um, they used to use sinew to thread them on, and they used to use a, and you'll see it come up in the photographs here, they used to use a wallaby jaw that they would hone the tooth, and that was what they did. So it was a lot more time consuming to be able to um, make these necklaces. Once the colonists came, they brought cotton thread and they brought metal tools, which then, and they brought needles that then made threading the necklaces easy. The other thing was that the women very quickly discovered the longer the necklace, the more money they could get for it. But the problem that developed with that is that the marinier shells are so precious and, as Lola says, are deteriorating. They're, they're, they're just not going to eventually be here for a number of reasons, which I'll go into afterwards. They started combining other shells into the necklaces. And this is where you get the different groupings of shells in the necklace. That is only a, a contemporary um, manifestation of shell, collect, of shell stringing. So that was a way that they could stretch the marineers and then they could make shells that didn't have marineers and they'd still be able to sell their necklaces. In collecting the shells, they're very environmentally conscious and they only collect as much as they need to collect to get a body of work done. So, and if it's a bad year when they go to Flinders, they may come back with very little. And then what they'll do is share amongst themselves. Now with the contemporary works, which are the other things that are made from possum fur, which is miles of that around, and the scallop shells and those sort of things, now they're not traditions. There's no traditions in that. That's Lola's own work. And she's the only person down in Tasmania who I know at the moment is doing that type of work with those contemporary pieces there. And I think what Lola says and is trying to do is it's a way that she can see being aware and being mindful to protect the shell resources that are part of their customs and their tradition and their history by only making so many, but then making these other works. When we went to Flinders Island, um, Number one, I was not allowed to tell or to identify in the book a photograph of where we went looking for King Marinier shells. If I did, I wouldn't be here. There are certain areas that they get certain shells from. While I was there, we didn't get any King Mariners. Um, Rex went down to a few little secret places and came back very despondent that pollution, it's not only man-made pollution that's affecting these marinier shells, um, it's natural runoff, it's also runoff from the new buildings that are being built on um, Flinders Island, which is the most beautiful place, but it is also, dare I say, climate change. Um, what is happening is the marinier shells grow 
on kelp. And they grow on ribbon kelp mainly and bubble kelp. And what is happening, the water is warming around Flinders Island and around Tasmania. So much so, we went down in March and I was expecting it to be freezing in the water. It's this Mediterranean climate, beautiful climate. With ve the water was warmer than what it was back in Sydney. And this water is warming and it's killing the kelp forests. If you've ever heard of the big giant kelp forests, that is off the northeastern side of Tasmania, and they talk about that has halved in its size in the last five years. It is because of climate, control, uh, climate change, because the water is getting warmer. And by getting warmer, it becomes polluted with a lot of natural things. And so it's not, you know, you just can't say, well, ban any future development in Flinders Island, ban the commercial fishing boats that have been there for a hundred years. Uh, it's not just them, it's actually what's happening in the ocean. And Lola's husband is very interested in with this and they are working with scientists, climate scientists and uh, biologists to find out what is happening. And they've all been told, you really can't stop it and they will disappear. What Lola has done in this exhibition is there are two bodies of work. There is the traditional necklaces and then there are what we have called her contemporary sculptural pieces, which, well, you could wear them. I could wear that scallop shell one. I love it. Um, but they're, they're more a, a sort of a statement piece. But the materials that Lola is using in those necklaces, the possum skin, the abalone shells, the warrener shells, the vertebrae of the, of the wallaby, they are all traditional because they're the materials and the, the things that they eat, wear or use traditionally. Um, so she's still trying to keep close to the traditions of using materials that are relevant in possibly other ways but she can bring them into making artworks with them that keep alive the stringing tradition. All the necklaces in the exhibition that are attributed to Lola are her own individual designs. The black and white necklaces that are in the centre of the exhibition, there are three, she acknowledges that when she makes them, she's thinking of her mother because her mother's signature was black and white necklaces. But the patterns, and the, the sequence of the shells is Lola's. The um, 19th century necklace that Lola restrung, that green, unbelievable green marinier shell necklace that we've got in there, Lola copied the pattern that the person had done. They can't identify who that person was and it's amazing, I've been with Lola and with Ray Norman, who is considered to be the leading um, academic expert on Tasmanian shell necklaces. And they can identify, if somebody brings them a shell necklace, they can identify whose it was by the pattern. You'll see in the exhibition, there's a necklace by Lola and her daughter using the same shells, rice shells, marineers, the black, Row, I think they are. And if you look at them, Lola's pattern is there and it's hers. And Vanessa's is just slightly different.